Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating. From the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day, each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show tonight. It is going to be UFOs, UFOs, and more UFOs. Well, and some experiencers all thrown in the mix, um, where in the first hour we're going to be speaking with Mary Rodwell about um, experiencers. Well, actually, let me get the title. Experiencers, UFO-related ET contact. And in the second hour, where we're going to be speaking with uh, Dr. Robert Davis about the UFO, phenom- UFO phenomena. Should I believe? Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, psychic readings, and energy healing. You know, if there are things going on in your life, if you need some help or guidance or direction on what path you should take, give me a call or drop me an email and we can set up a time for a private consultation. It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics, where all of their training programs are on sale through the month of April, save up to 40% on medical intuition training, intuitive counseling, or energy medicine training. That's www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com. One last announcement. My uh, latest project, the video uh, icon, Deconstructing the Archetypes of the Ancients, is now available. Well, it was available on digital download. Now you can actually purchase a copy from me, which is cheaper. You can get it from amazon.com. And if you've been thinking about but kind of hesitating buying some of my books, I'm offering a great package deal where you can get Icon Deconstructing the Archetypes of the Ancients, Man Made, the Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods, and Avoiding the Cosmic 2x4, buy all three items and save up to $18. I mean, that's a bargain. And they all come signed, autographed. They all come autographed, which is priceless. Anyway, we're going to have a great show tonight. In this first hour, we're going to be speaking with uh, Mary Rodwell. Let me tell you a little bit about her and bring her on the air. Mary Rodwell is a counselor, hypnotherapist, ufologist, researcher, metaphysician, former registered nurse and midwife in the UK. Mary is the founder and principal of ACERN, Australian Close Encounter Resource Network, and is recognized internationally as one of the leading researchers in the UFO and contact phenomena. She has lectured in the U.S., Canada, Hawaii, U.K., and New Zealand, and appears regularly in national and international media news programs. She is the author of numerous articles and a book entitled, Awakening, How Extraterrestrial Contact Can Transform Your Life. Her webpage is experiencer.co and acern.com.au. So please welcome Mary Rod. Well, hi, Mary. How are you? Hi, Dr. Rita, and good morning from Australia. Well, good evening from uh, the United <laughs> States. <laughs> I am just so glad to have you on. I um, watched a couple of your videos and actually I was not familiar with your work and I think some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight are new to me and I think going to be of really great interest to 
the, my listeners, I, I think we we have a pretty informed group that like the show, and I'm looking to, as you said before we went on the air, go down your rabbit hole. So let's jump on in. <laughs> Sounds um, good. Okay, let's start here. Just real easy. What drew you to working with experiencers or getting involved in the whole UFO concept in the first place? Well, I think I just want to um, draw your listeners to the fact that, you know, 40 years ago as a nurse midwife, if you told me that 40 years later I would be traveling the globe speaking about UFOs and aliens, I'd have probably sent you to the nearest psychiatrist and said, you know, there's some good medication out there. Um, so for me, it has been really quite a journey in the last 20 years since I created a CERN. And the reason for that was, as we know, life has all these synchronicities. And the synchronicities started with me picking up two books. One of them was um, Abduction by Dr. John Mack, a former uh, professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, and also a book called Communion by Whitley Strieber, who's had experiences. I didn't realize that within a few weeks of picking these books up, someone would walk into my counseling rooms and saying to me, Mary, I've heard you're open-minded. For this, there's no support groups. For this, they just think you're a loony. And proceeded to tell me about his experiences being taken up on spacecraft. He was explaining to me that he and his whole family were having experiences. So this was someone explaining this was not just his experience, waking up with marks on his body, shaved areas, explaining nosebleeds, um, lots of paranormal events. Nobody was coming to the house because the relatives think, thought it was demons. And he said, you know, I don't know where to go. And fortunately, as it seems to happen to many of us, I was at least prepared for this possibility through the books that I'd just read a few weeks prior to that. And that in itself is quite an interesting synchronicity. I thought it was very rare and thought, well, you know, this gentleman is, is explaining to me very much what Dr. John Mack was talking about, what Strieber was talking about. And, I, and that really was the beginning. And from that, it's taken me into this rabbit hole that you mentioned so beautifully, Dr. Ada, of going into places and into understanding that now um, creates for me the dilemma that it creates for those that have these experiences. How do you marry this understanding with the consensus reality that says, unless you can touch, feel, see and smell it, it's not real. Whereas in fact, this is so real but it's real in a way that many people as yet don't fully understand. But see, you're in good company here because my world is very alternative. Um, I, I think it's interesting, your story, how that synchronicity, I love your synchronicity. With that one client, um, did it just kind of open the door to this whole group of people just <laughs> finding you without uh, even putting any kind of word out? Oh, look, it was within two weeks, I had another lady. Um, and then I met a social worker that had, um, she just had a baby. And uh, she contacted me through another organization and said, look, you know, I thought I was going crazy because I was seeing these strange mantis uh, ant like beings in my lounge room thinking, well, I, you know, she's a social worker. I'm definitely losing the plot here until somebody knocked on her door who was a friend who happened to be very intuitive who walked through the door and said, do you realize there's three strange beings in this, in your lounge room? So she <laughs> said, you can actually see them too. And she said, yes. So we teamed up and we created the first, what we called then the abduction support group in Perth. And within the, the, the putting out the advertisement, having no idea what that was going to generate, we ended up with 12 people as instantly as that. And it was then suddenly I got this understanding that this was far more common than I'd ever realized. And since then, 3,000 individuals have contacted me from all around the globe, from as far away as Kenya, Uruguay, you know, Hungary, Poland, um, Alaska. So this is global. And, and what is even more fascinating to me is that many people only believe that 
you know, encounters incorporate a fearful abduction experience. And if I don't have that, then I can't possibly be one of these. In truth, many of the intuitives I speak to, such as uh, individuals like yourself, Dr. Reader, and, and others in the spiritualist metaphysical field, when they see, you know, an angelic being, others will see a light being. You know, it's, it's often an, um, a matter of interpretation, how you interpret your experiences or your encounters. But it covers the gamut of all of that. Um, but it depends on your own belief systems and your own programming in how you interpret it. So I've met many intuitives, mediums, clairvoyants, um, those within the healing fields that have not fully understood that maybe some of the ways they heal and the way they connect to the non-physical realm is actually more, you know, it isn't, or, and it may be what they interpret as spirit guides, you know, their higher self, their super conscious, but also may very well be some of these intelligences that have been visiting us all through the ages that were seen as gods. And I know that you're well informed on that because of our previous quick conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, and I find it interesting that where you're going, the road you're going down is to talk about these non-corporeal beings versus, you know, the alien comes in their spaceship and lands on your lawn and, and takes you out. I mean, which is most people's vision. So uh, let, let me back my question up. In your work with these clients, do you find that there is a variety of the kind of visitation? Are some people visited by more corporeal type beings versus these non-corporeal beings? They may have both. Um, so, you know, what I, I have come to understand in, in as much as my research has show, show me in 20 years is there a matrix of visitations in the sense that we have the, you know, the physical extraterrestrial types. We also have the interdimensional, what seems to be extra dimensional. We also seem to perhaps be visited by what we would call time travelers, you know, um, uh, beings from what we would term our future. And understanding that perhaps time is a linear concept, which is a third dimensional concept and that in fact many of those that have experiences seem to understand that many of these intelligences are able to manipulate what we call time they can expand it they can they can um, they can change how we understand time in in ways that as yet we can't understand and there may be such things as parallel universes many other dimensions um, timelines and a whole range of things in the quantum universe that as yet the scientists are trying to grapple with as these mysteries they, you know, they're trying to explain that seem to be understood perhaps from a, 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 an understanding of a, an omniverse of realities that we're only just beginning to glimpse at. But I think the notion of non-dimensional, non-corporeal beings, whether from this dimension, you know, Regardless of where they're from, we'll, let's just not even go there in this moment. Um, there is a long documented history of a belief in these beings interacting with humanity, um, whether you call them a god, whether you call them a spirit guide or an angel or an extraterrestrial, which is just to me another label that you can put on this being um, that I, I always find it interesting and and joke around that the scientists need to go down to the metaphysical bookstore and, and buy a couple of books and and maybe they would understand what is really going on I believe there are scientists that do, are doing that and I'm also in touch with some of those scientists and that's actually what free um, uh, and the experience dot co um, is it that website really for free, the foundation for research into extraterrestrial encounters. Why that has become a really important focus for those within this field is that it is a multidisciplinary team. We have scientists, astrophysicists and physicists. We have those that are experiencing, you know, the experience of themselves that may have had many types of experience that just, 
you know, that are not just within that very limited way of looking at extraterrestrial encounters. Many of them have near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, may understand their experience as being um, them being a hybrid, for example, or a walk-in. Is, is another term some people seem to feel is their experience. And it may be a whole combination of all of that in terms of their encounters or their interactions with these intelligences. However, their lens, whatever lens they're, they're wishing to explore it in. And so what we're trying to do with free is understand that this is a matrix of experience and different interpretations, which is, is showing us that we live in a multidimensional world and that we are communicating with them as the indigenous peoples already know. You know, they are aware, for example, the mantid beings that many people are interacting with. And I've got a little eight-year-old that tells me that's his family, that's where his origin is. These are called the mamu in, Aust in, in, the, in our uh, Australian Aboriginal culture. And they are considered ones who teach. The Hosa in South, South Africa um, call the mamu um, the same beings, the one who teaches. So what is very clear is the indigenous tribes all around the globe are interacting, are comfortable with the fact they're being visited by what they call their star family or these other many different forms of intelligence that have been assisting them on so many levels all the way through their cultures. And it's the Western mind that has wanted to find a way to understand them through a very limited consensus reality when most of us, and I believe all of us, can tap into the non-physical realm. It's just that we have been taught to deny it and not to give it. It's the, creden um, the credibility and the, t the um, veracity that it needs to be, that needs to be um, part of this. And part of my work has been when people come to me and they say, look, Mary, I feel I'm communicating with particular um, beings and they may be all different forms from the greys right through to various other forms, light beings. They may mention um, ant-like, um, mantis-like beings, feline beings, um, a whole range, crystalline beings. And they're saying, look, I've known that, that in some level I am connected to them. And, you know, they, they help me. They help me understand who I am. And for, for us to deny that reality, I think, is, is ridiculous because when you've got millions of people out there, I believe, having these interactions, but many of them are not allowed, they're not given um, a chance to explore them because our society, certainly our Western society, says, again, you know, that the non-physical realm is one that is, is most often denied and people are seen as crazy. And when they phone me, the first thing they may say is, Mary, I think I'm going crazy. And then I say, well, would you like to tell me about it? Why is it that you feel that way? And then I hear the same patterns of experience. And often it's starting right from when they were a small child, where they may have seen, seen little beings around them that we used to call, you know, the imaginary, the little imaginary friend. Well, I'm not so sure they're as imaginary as we'd like to think they are. But the trouble is that the, the young person more and more has been told by maybe family or friends or their school friends friends laughed at if they explain that they've had interactions with um, something that isn't physical. Um, many say, you know, I remember going up on spacecraft when I was five years old, talked about it at school, and I would get laughed at. So what happens with many of those that have had these interactions, they've shut down. And they shut down in a way that they find it very hard then to validate when they're older and they become more aware that perhaps this is a reality after all. And I think, and I know we're going to talk more about your work with children, So, I, but I'm just going to make this comment. Um, at this point, I find that things are changing so much. There, you know, there is this generation... Uh, there's some siren going off. That's not good. Uh, there's a there's a generation that's coming up that grew up on shows like Ghost Hunters and Ancient Aliens and and uh, UFO Files. And when with their children, they're they're believing their children or you know asking people questions so that they can understand 
what their child is trying to communicate with them and trying not to shut them down, which I think is wonderful, wonderful. Okay, but I'm gonna go back to something you said earlier. Um, one of the things that you commented on was about the experience itself. And most people have this impression that if you have uh, some kind of abduction experience, you're, you know, levitated out of your bed and you're taken up to a ship and they do all kinds of scientific poking and prodding experiments and then they put you back in bed. But it sounds like you're saying that that's not everyone's experience with them. Um, you're absolutely correct. Of the 3,000 odd that I have so far supported one way or another, what is really important for people to understand is the ones that are traumatized through one reason or another, and sometimes I must say not necessarily because of what's happened, but because of what they've anticipated might have happened. You know, um, they may just be fearful of the unknown. And that's only about 25% of the hundred percent. The rest of those that contact me, which, you know, we use the word star seeds or star kids or whatever. These are individuals whose experience is far more um, conscious and far more um, profound in the sense that they have a deep sense of knowing. Um, they will say to me, Mary, I've always felt I've, I'm not from here that I've got another family and it's in some other part of the universe. Um, I don't understand, you know, um, humanity. I think it's, it's very uncivilized and very barbaric. I don't even know why would, I would have chosen to come here. Um, my body doesn't feel right. Um, I, I don't understand how things work here. They will explain that they feel they've got a mission or a purpose and um, whatever it is they're not quite sure of. Many of them also manifest very unusual expressions of their contact. And by that, I mean, they may st find themselves writing strange, unusual scripts. Some of it looks like shorthand or a mix of Chinese or, or, or Arabic. They've got no idea why they're motivated to do these um, kinds of expressions. Maybe geometric art. They find themselves drawing the beings that they feel that they're connected to. And some of them come out with strange languages that as yet, you know, we call them star languages. But they may actually be able to identify from where these are from. And I know this may sound really strange to some people um, who hear this. But to me, you don't manifest all these things, you know, out of a fantasy, you know, because they're as confused when they do these things as anyone else that's looking at them. But I have files of scripts and, and strange, unusual um, writing that people have sent to me from all ages. Even small children have written these scripts at three, four, five and six years old and saying, look, mummy, these are important children talking about going through walls and being taught on spacecraft at five and six years old. Um, a a four-year-old drawing a, a triangular craft and saying this is where he goes and, and draws an energy field around it. And I, I say, you know, children don't, you know, watch talk shows. They don't read books on this. And yet they are speaking of profound concepts that a four, five, six, seven or eight year old should have no knowledge of. And yet they do. Unfortunately, their parents often seem to be um, able to accept this more because they've often been experiences because this does seem to be intergenerational, that each generation seems to have a link to these intelligences. So I often say, look, were, you know, was your, were your parents, either of them, very intuitive or felt things were going on? Or, you know, even grandparents. And they'll say, oh, you know, my, my grandmother was really intuitive. She was quite psychic or whatever. And they can actually see the links going right down to their own children that are coming out with this kind of information. So there is um, an intergenerational link and there is a suggestion which to me is, appears to be very clear now that each generation is an upgrade, if you like, in terms of its in their uh, awareness or their multidimensional awareness. And this is where I talk about the star children, these children that are coming in now that are really amazing. 
And, you know, I, we can perhaps talk about that a little bit as well, because the parents write to me and say, this is what my daughter or my son is saying. Um, and I've had experiences, you know, how do I support them? Exactly. Um, on that note, on that note, there is so much controversy. I'm going to kind of take it into a, a, a weird place. There's so much controversy about um, autism, you know, whether it is because of uh, immunization or whatever. But one of the things that you find in those children at the same time are these very advanced skill sets in certain areas. And uh, my sister has an autistic son and he brings through all kinds of beings. Her house, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting house to go visit. Anyway, um, how do they fit into this whole thing? Do you have any thoughts or comments? I actually think you're, you know, you're spot on. And one of the things that I've been exploring, because so many parents that have had experiences talk about having either a child who has Asperger's, maybe ADHD, maybe a bit of both. They may have certain types of autism, which we've, we're discovering these children appear to be telepathic um, and also even dyslexia, perhaps. And I kept wondering because um, you do a lot of wondering trying to connect the dots. And I thought to myself, if I was an extraterrestrial intelligence and I know that the programming on this planet was inaccurate and that people are being programmed into a limited understanding of their reality, let's make it harder for them to be programmed. And that to me seemed a very logical way to go. And what I, I've got two scientists that have actually confirmed my hypothesis around this. And I'm just going to say what Dr. William Brown, who's got a PhD in biology and cellular and molecular biology, who actually uh, sent me his, what he feels about these children. And he said this, he said, um, he said, I believe, he says, that genetic modification is occurring right now in utero and is actually producing a new human. This is shown by the exponential increase in autistic, ADD and indigo children. The new genetic architecture allows them to see the world in a multidimensional fashion. And I believe research would show dormant genetic regions are being integrated into the biological system and this is occurring in all of us to produce expanded awareness. Their brains are working faster. They have access to more information. In classroom, learning is much faster than normal. I believe they already know what's being taught. And the intrinsic understanding of certain knowledge and information goes down to biomolecular level, where sentient activity of the brain actually takes place in the atomic structure of the DNA mo molecules. It's transgenerational information and encoded as I say, it's encoded in the DNA. Now, that was fascinating to get confirmation of something that I had been looking at as a possibility for some years. And I'm now in contact with another scientist in Europe who she calls them the letter people. And she said these programs such as ADD, ADHD, Asperger's, she said are letter people. I do not believe the theory that these are broken genes, but instead offering a new multidimensional skills to prevent limited reprogramming of a third dimensional reality. And it's not so simple as foreign DNA. It's a combination of genetically improved bodies in combination with souls from different places in our universe incarnating in these improved bodies. The souls have different frequencies and vibrations depending on their evolutionary status and that plays a role in activation of the DNA in a particular body and this scientist is an experiencer and she is actually going to be more open about her own background because she sees herself as one of these letter people and how you can support them through diet through understanding and other methods that will enable them to function better so they're not blitzed with Ritalin and all these other things that are being put into place in these young children where they are, you know, programmed again out of this awareness. Well, they are just so sensitive. That's been my, they are just open to receiving all of the energy around them 
And a lot of the times the energy is very discordant, angry. I, I think I would act out if I had to just feel that bad all the time. And this is exactly it. What If we really understand that these new children have the ability and many of them are able to pick up your thoughts. I had an email from a, a lady just recently who told me that her three-year-old daughter is without doubt reading her mind. And she said, it's, it's become very, very difficult, Mary, because she's not only reading mind, she's reading the mind of those around her. And she said, have you ever tried to keep your thoughts pure and, and with integrity all the time? Do you know how tiring that is? She said to me, you know, um, but what I understand, I've talked to a 13 year old that told me when she was in classroom that what that, you know, that it was difficult because what her teacher was saying and what she was thinking, she said the difference between what she was saying and what she was thinking was completely different. And what her teacher was thinking wasn't very nice. So what we have to be aware of now, if this is actually part of these new um, humans, as I call them, we are going to really have to lift our game as a species to understand that we are being tasked to come from integrity, for, to come from a place of honesty, integrity and love you know, ultimately, which is huge and about time as far as I'm concerned, because at the moment, what do we do when we disagree with someone? Apparently on this planet, you shoot them. So I think that has to change. Yeah, I think so. Mary, I want to go back. I don't mean to jump around, but you're covering so much material. I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. You were talking about... Um, these individuals coming out with some kind of a language or some kind of a written script in your collecting this information, have you found that you have multiple people actually using the same script at all or the same, you know, language, which might be a little more challenging to identify? Some of it, certainly. I was told by someone who spoke these languages that some of them can be translated um, in the way that we, we speak, but some cannot because they're too complex. In other words, one particular symbol alone could be a compressed file of information that would fill a room with encyclopedias in terms of its information. So it's multidimensional. It's a, it's a compressed file. But I've had those that can translate them. And I'm going to surprise your listeners by saying that I've had a seven-year-old that, um, that was looking at um, her mother had my book Awakening and in it is some script. And this young girl was saw, saw her mother reading it and said, I can read that. And her mother aunt said, well, how can you read it? She said, I just know how to do that. And so this young girl, the mother got the young girl who lives in Queensland. And on Skype, I spoke to her and I said, can you read it to me? She said, do you want it in the language or do you want it in English? And I said, could you do both? Oh, yes, she said. Very confident seven-year-old. And so she spoke in the language. She then translated it into English. And I thought I would ask her. I pushed her a little bit more. And I said, can you tell me the source of this information? Oh, yes, she said, it's the greys. Now, this is a seven-year-old child. I actually did a similar thing with her, with some other adults, and I gave her a book of some of these scripts, and I said, could you read any of these? I can't read all of them, she said, but I can read this one. And you could see her, you know, looking at each piece of it. It wasn't like she just, you know, was able to just just say it. You could see that she was working it out. And again, she did it in an, another language. She then translated it for me. And then I said, um, can you tell me the source of this one? Oh, that's the greys and the mantid beings. Now, again, this is a seven-year-old that is explaining this to me. I have a nine-year-old in Northern Europe whose mother contacted me saying her daughter of nine speaks three of these star languages and wanted to talk to me about them. And this young girl apparently told her mother that she can speak to water to heal it. In other words, the frequency of this language in some way reprogrammed water. 
Now, for anyone who's struggling with that, let's look at the work of Dr. Masaru Emoto, Messages in Water. This is, a, you know, a Japanese scientist who sadly died a, a little while ago, where he was showing how the actual um, the droplets of water that he was um, he was um, looking at through a microscope that frequencies of music, prayer, intent, all these things can actually change the nature of of that particular um, droplet of water. And of course, you know we are realizing now how water can be programmed. And what we're really hearing is that she's speaking of frequency that alters the nature of water. And this is, you know, I've heard others say that they, you know, they're aware, including this scientist, that you can reprogram water. So what really all we need is enough of those from both sides of the fence to understand that just because the language is different, it may actually be saying the same thing. And this is what intrigues me is whenever I get some information like that, then I'm seeking to understand it from as many levels as possible because sometimes the problem is we have become so specialized in the way that we understand our reality that we don't realize that we need information, multidisciplinary information. And then looking at it from that broader brush can start to understand more of what this is and what this means. The message is that you were shared that were shared with you do you recall what they were was there anything significant that was conveyed yes and um the the first information from her was they were talking about the planet they were talking about how we are damaging the planet on so many levels and that we don't understand that this affects not just us but it affects you know, in, in a kind of multi, multi-dimensional way, it actually f- affects other realities, other, other universes, and particularly things like, you know, the uh, atom bomb and these kinds of things, nu- nu- nuclear bombs, for example, because they're saying that doesn't just affect you. You don't appreciate that. And so it was an, an ecological message about what we need to do. But some of the symbols and the, the that some of my clients have, you know, all through their lives, they found themselves being drawn to doing these particular symbols, never really understanding it. One lady came to me, had been doing it all her life and said, Mary, I want to understand why I'm impelled, you know, and, and, and I feel I can't not do them, but I want to understand why. And what was really fascinating with what she told me when we went into her subconscious, superconscious to understand um, ask this question, what, what she got from that was some of them are what, what she called time locked. In other words, it seems that when we reach a certain level, I believe, of understanding, then this information will be made available. And the way that I've interpreted that is that we are, um, I think, as a species now, we are shifting in our awareness and our consciousness. And it's almost like as we upgrade, whether our biological system, you know, I I call it, you know, the hard drive, the biological hard drive, um, we only use 5% of our DNA as far as we understand. We only use a tenth of our brain capacity. Nature does not waste its time by creating um, what isn't useful. So what is it for? My sense is, and I have got absolutely no idea whether I'm correct, but I, I'm a, a pretty logical kind of person. And to me, logic dictates that maybe we are now reaching a point where there will be some kind of shift uh, in our awareness and consciousness that we actually get switched on in every sense. And we're going to become like the supercomputer. And with the supercomputer, we're going to need new software. So I'm wondering whether all this data that's coming in that we can't understand as yet is the software for the new superhuman, the human that we're all evolving into, perhaps. But that's the only, that is one idea that I have of, 
you know, we're always trying to work these out, aren't we? And, and certainly I am. And I'm trying to logically work out what is the purpose of all these interactions where people change after their experiences, dramatically change in terms of their attitude to the planet. Many of them become healers. Many of them, you know, lose interest in materialistic values. Many of them seem to be driven to look at everything from astronomy to quantum physics and have downloads of these kinds of um, complex information. What is it for unless in some way these intelligences, which I believe are part of our own genetic heritage, are assisting us to reach a point where we can become part of maybe the galactic community, and, but we've got to grow up first and mature and they're giving us, I suspect, a helping hand. That's how I've interpreted it up to date. I've no idea whether I'm right, but that is, you know, uh, um, I don't know if anyone has a, the complete idea. I think it's far too complex in many ways for us to make any categoric statements. But that seems to be the broad brush that I'm looking at at the moment. But it seems that they have been helping us all along from deep, 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 deep antiquity. And you read the mythology and the gods taught us agriculture. The gods taught us how to use fire. The gods gave us clothes to wear. The gods taught us how to work with metal. The gods taught us everything. And so if, they're, if we're upgrading, I don't know that we would be upgrading due to our, our own hand. You know, that even people that are creative geniuses, in my opinion, kind of channel that information in from somewhere and then manifest it on the physical plane. I agree, absolutely. And this is my thinking too, is that many of our geniuses, you know, everything from Leonardo da Vinci to Einstein to Tesla and all of those, I believe that these intelligences have used them as a conduit. They often say that when they got these inspirations, they went into a meditative state, for example, or they got them in a dream state. This is the way it's happening now. This is the way it's happening to, I believe, millions of people across the globe. And I actually don't think it's just a few select people. I think we're all, as a species, being um, upgraded, um, depending on our personal awareness, our personal acceptance. And because we're all different and we all perceive the world differently, our experience of that is different. And our experience of that will depend on also our receptiveness to change, our receptiveness as an individual to want to, you know, become a better person and, and, and a more loving person, a more um, multidimensionally aware person. All of that is, is integral to each individual. So that is why we experience it all differently. You know, as a nurse, you know, you have five people who have an appendicectomy. Every single one of them will have a different experience of that appendicectomy. And this is the same with every experience that we have, you know, from, you know, our families, our, you know, our childhood to our education. We all see the world through a distinct window of our own programming and our own awareness and our own receptivity to those changes. And so instead of being you know, um, you know, exclusive, I think that what we have to do is listen to every window of reality that we're hearing from all these individuals that are having these experiences, because that is giving us more of an understanding of the broader picture of reality. Because at the moment, I believe we're trying to understand something through the eye of a needle, when in fact we should be listening to one another because with more of those patterns that they experience, the more we may ha have a better understanding of how this is happening. Because yes, I believe there are our ancestors. They are the ones that created us to be on this planet. And this seems to be happening um, through the galaxies, according to some of my clients. I have an eight-year-old that tells me that they create portals into other universes and they seed other universes. And, you know, it, this is what an eight-year-old is telling me, talking about the Big Bang and, and the expanding universe and how we've been many different types of species, you know, and some of them are millions of years old. Well, you can dismiss that as the, the fantasy of an eight-year-old child, but I don't know many eight-year-old children. I'm a grandmother who've had, 
you know, three children of my own. I've got four grandchildren. They don't talk about black holes and, and portals and, and, and gates into other universes. So, you know, for me, I listen to that kind of information. Exactly. But I, I need to ask the hard question. And so just kind of take it in the way that it's going to come. What makes you believe that the information that they're sharing with us is not being used to manipulate us into being a more subservient uh, culture for some other diabolical purpose <laughs> that we don't know about? <laughs> Oh look, um, I yeah, come on! I had to throw out the ultimate. I think it's and, and I think it's a very good one because there are many people that do believe that we're being manipulated and whatever. Well, let's start with human manipulation, shall we? Um, I, I don't really want to get into <laughs> how we're manipulated over the TV, over everything we're reading, um, and the disinformation. And I, I sort of put politicians along with car salesmen in, in that sort of view. In fact, I'm not sure um, if there's an equal dynamic there or whatever. Look, we're manipulated all the time. But, but my reasoning at the moment is this. If we're being manipulated into being more loving, more caring, more aware of the matrix of reality and that we are um, inhabiting a multiverse or an omniverse with other intelligences, then, you know, on one level, if that helps us to grow spiritually, for me, that's a pretty good way to go. At the moment, we're killing one another if we disagree with one another. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is this. If these intelligences wanted to do that, well, you know, we were only not so, that, not so long ago just learning how to create fire. It's really interesting to turn us into mindless robots, right, and biological fo fodder at that point. Why wait till we have weapons to shoot down craft and whatever? That doesn't actually sort of logically make a great deal of sense. So, you know, for me, they've had plenty of time because, you know, they've had all the ability to do that over millennia. So they haven't. So... Um, Yes, they may, they're certainly, and I don't know if all of them have the same mandate. I can't say because there's so much I don't know. But all I'm seeing is that the people I meet that have had encounters, when they embrace that understanding, when they feel supported by these intelligences, they're actually really nice people. And you know what? If we're being manipulated into being good people, personally, I don't have a problem with that. But I may be just another one being manipulated. And, you know, I'd rather live in a society that is honoring of one another and loving of one another, even if that's being manipulated, than one that says, you've got a different color to me, you believe something different, so I'm going to shoot you or behead you. I mean, to be quite honest, that doesn't resonate with me. So, um, but I don't know. I don't think any of us know. I only know that I would rather be in a loving society, even if the ultimate, that's somebody else's agenda, than one where we are harming each other and treating each other worse than we would, we would treat anything. I mean, I, that just does not fit for me. So I don't know, guys. I'm along with everybody else. I just don't think logically that that seems to fit or resonate that, you know, we're, we're um, being put into a place where they're just going to come and take us over. But I don't know. So and, you know, and none of your eight year olds have like shared from the scripts um, a recipe for like leg of human or human <laughs> stew or or anything like that. Right. So I can oh, kind of no. like go, whew. Oh, Feel no, safe what for they're now. talking about, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's one 17-year-old that tells me he's come to this planet to create an ecologically friendly environment. So in other words, building, you know, where we can live in harmony with the environment, how we can create pollution-free energies and energy, how to create healing frequencies and healing technologies, for example. You know what? I don't hear that from the drug companies. I don't hear that so much from the medical profession. Um, I don't hear that so much from governments or, you know, on our planet. Because from what I've, I'm seeing is more and more manipulation, more and more control, and less and less respect for humanity. 
that's what I'm seeing on this planet. I don't know if you feel it's the same, but I'm I, not too in love amen, with humanity sister. at the moment. <laughs> you know? And you're in a different country. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I wanted to ask, are there certain things that trigger these changes in people? It seems that whatever goes on within their interactions, and some of them may not always go physically, by the way, to these craft. They may go um, what we would call astrally or their their consciousness goes to these places and they appear to be taught things. This eight-year-old said that when he goes up on the craft, and remember, this is not hypnosis. This is conscious recall with a couple of his friends. He says that he, he will, you know, sometimes he's in a, a, a kind of tube where he can't move and there's beings watching him and blue beings. And I said, do you know why, what's going on? He said, oh, yes, that's my yearly medical exam. But sometimes I'm on the craft with um, some of my school friends and we use our brain waves to learn things, to learn how to manipulate matter, to learn about things like black holes and the true nature of humanity and where we're going. So, you know, he's got all conscious recall of exactly what, what he's learning. And it all seems to be about us finally discovering our potential. This is what I'm getting from the children. And they are saying, you know, that we have to change. And the only way we're going to change is when we come from integrity. And they are, many of them, as I say, are able to, you know, um, tap into thought and also manipulate matter and all these things that I think we have to be grown ups to do with to do ethically. And my sense is that, you know, why these people that have experiences change is because they understand finally that we're all connected, that in fact, we are all part of this consciousness that we call humanity and that what we do to others ultimately impacts on us as well. You know, and that's all the spiritual teachers were saying the same thing is mm -hmm. don't do to someone else that you wouldn't like done to you. And you know what makes a great deal of sense to me? Okay, I had a question in my brain and it just went whoop. Um, do individuals have to have, uh, I'm going to say contact, conscious contact with these extraterrestrials or go up in their ship? Um, can they have an experience where they think they're communicating with their higher self or they're channeling or they are in a contemplated state and they just bring through this information to automatic writing. I mean, would this also be contact with these extraterrestrials potentially? Absolutely. And I found many clairvoyance mediums, um, you know, we're called psychics, mediums, whatever it's, you know, I call them intuitives. Um, I think many of them are literally accessing that information and they're being assisted to access these downloads as one eight-year-old called knowledge bombs in her head. And some of them know exactly who's giving it to them. This nine-year-old in Europe told me she'd got two beings that give her information. One is a green, little green ET and the other one's a blue being that she has a name for, Imoko. And she said they actually teach her about the origin of the species, what, she, you know, what her role is in helping her family wake up. Um, also other potentials. She, she taught them about, um, called it seven different books on, on terms of what, in terms of what, even understanding the source which she called an ultra-terrestrial that lived in Dayland, which, which is the land of light with the angels, is how she described it. For, and it had no gender. Um, this is how she explains it. So what I believe many, you know, the intuitives are doing, they may see, you know, they may call them spirit guides. They may call them their higher self, super conscious, over soul. Um, with if someone who's very religious may see that as as angels, or they may see it as you know um, either ascended masters or or Jesus or Buddha. To be quite honest, um, I think it just the information comes in in a way that that particular soul or individual is able to process it. So it comes in, you know, fitting in with their own personal programming, whether it's educational, spiritual 
religious or whatever, so that they can process it to a point where they're ready to look at it from a broader perspective, a more universal kind of spirituality, which I think ultimately is about us realizing that we're only ever seeing things through a very limited lens and that we have to expand on that to embrace, I think, our galactic heritage is how I understand it. Exactly. And just a little comment, one of the things that I have found in my work is that, and not work, but conversations with people, is that many people that are intuitive, and I'm going to say of my generation, your generation, not this new group coming through, are all dyslexic. All of them. Mm. Mm. And it's like, you too? <laughs> you too? Um, where do we go from here? We have about... Well, three or four minutes. Where do we go from here? Where do you go from here? <laughs> That's a good question. Do you get um, to get back out of the private hole? <laughs> Look, I, I've got to a point where I've just got to trust now because it is, you know, I could go in so many different directions with my conscious mind and have not a clue where I'm going. So I've learned to trust um, on, on some level what I call my soul journey, that it will lead me where I need to go next. And I have an overwhelming um, passion for the children and, you know, being there as a support for the parents with these new children coming in that are, are being born into a very confusing matrix of realities. So they're a, of particular focus for me. But I think we're, we're heading towards a really important time in humanity's growth. And I'm not sure any of us really have an idea how that's going to unfold. I think it's a time of pr trust and a time where I think we'll be led and guided by perhaps, you know, other um, wiser intelligences um, and more cluey intelligences than we are in, in our conscious mind. And for me, I trust now that whatever I'm, wherever I'm supposed to go to help with whatever this may be, that I will be guided to, to where I need to focus my energies. And that feels cool for me. I'm, I've given up trying to control my world because I realize I can't control anything anyway. So why bother? Um, I will just wait to see what each day unfolds and tells me. Do you believe that where you're receiving guidance from is coming from extraterrestrials? And if so, who or what species or what are they, <laughs> you know, how would you classify your non-corporeal beings? Um, I classify them as very loving and very tolerant of me because I'm such a skeptic. And so, you know, if I ever get information intuitively, I say right now, guys, you've got to prove it. And so um, down the track, you can bet your bottom dollar they do, because I've always said I'll stop listening to you as soon as you give me something that isn't going to that isn't going to um, make any sense or I can't prove it in any way. You know, so they're pretty good at, at giving me stuff that I can uh, one way or another understand or or prove has a vera has veracity. And they, as I say, they appear to be very loving and tolerant of me. So I'm very grateful for that. And to be quite honest, I think, you know, very well that we all have that guidance, whether you call it guardian angels or whatever, you know, you, you know, guides or whatever, whether that's our higher selves, our oversoul, or whether or not that's all of the above, really to me doesn't matter as long as it's loving and helps me live my life with integrity. So, you know, I'm very grateful for that. So if they're really going to use me just to um, eat me up at the end of the day, well, I hope I taste okay because I'm getting on a bit now and I'm probably a bit stringy. <laughs> Mary, our time is up. You are great. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you or find out more about your work, um, where is the best place to send them? Well, they can Google me and then they've got a CERN that will come up or free as well. So I'm very easy to find, you know, and there's lots of videos, YouTube presentations. Um, so they can, they can find me in a n number of ways. It's very, very easy. And it's not Mary Roswell, I will tell them, even though many of them would like to call me that. Um, it still is only Rodwell. So there you go. Well. No, I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to shut up. Okay, Mary, thank you so much for coming on the show. And um, have a great day. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Dr. Rita, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting you me. 
You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's Mary Rodwell, her webpage.